And so should they eat humans then? Well, despite obviously their monstrous look and obviously their size, coconut crabs primarily eat organic material consisting mainly of plants and, as the name suggests... Coconuts. Coconuts. Right. So... That's what they want you to believe. Mm. So you're walking around, go, oh, it's fine, I'm, I'm fine, there's just some coconuts around. And then you turn on your back and they eat you. Oh my god, can you imagine being ambushed by a bunch of crabs? Welcome to the Compendium, an assembly of high-flying tales where the truth is often stranger than fiction and plain logic sometimes goes overboard. Overboard? Are we talking about boat this, this episode? What else do you think is in that clue, that, that pun-ridden clue that we have today? Oh, it's pun-riddled, is it? Um, mm. High-flying. Well, it's either I thought about boat by going overboard, otherwise perhaps we're going to be in the sky this week. Well, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Should we go on with introductions? Let's do it. For those of you tuning in for the very first time, I am your host, Kyle Reesey. I'm frequently found charting a course through laundry piles, juggling domestic challenges, all while navigating the realm of the fascinating and obscure. God, you're a liar. We have a cleaner, Kyle. And, uh, well, I'm your co-host, Adam Cox, and I'm never missing a chance to join Kyle in unearthing intriguing mysteries for instance, I'm interested to know who keeps taking your dirty laundry out of the basket and mysteriously placing it on the ground near the laundry. I think that's a mystery solved. It's definitely Keith. Keith? Keith. Keith. I don't think the viewers know about Keith, do they? Oh yeah, Keith is our wonderful Maine Coon cat. Maybe we should include a picture in the uh, in the show notes. Yeah, we tried to do an Instagram page, for, but then we really lost interest very quickly on that. If you're interested in seeing this magnificent beast... I think it's at, like, Keith Goes to Hollywood. Something like that. He's never been to Hollywood. Well, Not yet. <laughs> it's, aspira- it's an aspirational Instagram account. What have you been up to this week? Have you been keeping a watchful eye on your household, ensuring that no Turpin family-esque saga unfolds? I hope not. I'm still slightly traumatised what they did to their kids. I made peanut butter sandwiches on Wednesday, and, well... It's probably going to be a slippery slope from there. Definitely a slippery slope. I mean, I did make them for myself and not anyone else. Oh, you're putting yourself through the abuse. Well, no one makes a peanut butter sandwich like I do, so... Hang on a minute. I make the best peanut butter sandwiches. You just make plain or boring peanut butter on bread, whereas I take it to the next level. I put cane pepper, I put salt, I put sometimes raisins in there to give it that kind of that dainty taste. Sometimes I put banana in there. All you need is white bread, butter, peanut butter. Nah. The best. Nah, 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 nah. I make the best peanut butter sandwiches. No contest. We should have a peanut butter sandwich off. Fine. Okay. Well, before we do that, have you got any news for us this week? I do, actually. Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah. So, I was uh, playing around on TikTok the other day, and I came across this little video. This is going to blow you away. So, this woman on TikTok, She is like some kind of doctor or something, right? So she's out at a bar having a nice glass of wine. And um, she's telling us a bit about her time in residency, where she learned about something called human decanting. Have you ever heard of human decanting before? It feels like the human centipede. It's not anything like that, is it? I'm going to say it's kind of in that realm. Oh, no. So she has this patient that's coming into the resident clinic complaining of some kind of bothersome kind of urinary symptoms and they diagnose him with a UTI and they send him out with a prescription for antibiotics but he keeps coming back, right? right. So they're a bit concerned. So he, when he comes back, the, bacteri- the bacteria in his urinary tract is kind of really strange. On top of that, it's also pretty rare for a man to have or develop any kind of urinary tract kind of infection, right? right? It's normally a female thing. Okay. So they recommend that he have a, I think it's like a, a cystocoscopy or something like that. Basically, they go 
they put a camera down Ooh. into his urethra or something Ouch. to look inside his bladder to see kind of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And while they're doing this, he starts opening up a bit about himself and they discover that he actually is what they call a human decanter. I mean, it, felt, it feels quite strange that this is the time that he'd feel a good time to open up yeah, and share. He's just opening up. He's having a bit of small talk, a bit of chit-chat. This is what I'm about. These are my hobbies, you know. Okay. So they're like, okay, what's a, what's a human decanter? So he goes to parties and he will empty out his bladder okay. using a catheter and then he'll backfill it with red wine. In this case, it was red wine. Now, the Urban Dictionary says that decanters usually urinate into glasses and then serve their guests. But this particular decanter was urinating into the mouths of other party guests. Oh. What? <laughs> so he's, how, he's extracted the urine through a catheter. Uh-huh. God knows how they work. Don't ask me. This is, this is just the compendium. Fine. But then he's put wine in that catheter bag. He's doing, he's backfilling it somehow. I don't know how. Possibly, yeah. He's probably putting the wine back into that kind of bag that he's right. decanted out of and then pouring it back into his bladder and then serving red wine by peeing in people's mouths. Oh my God, that's, oh. I mean, it has to be a fetish thing, right? Yeah. It has to be. Would you get drunk quicker that way? Why? I guess it's still alcohol in there. Yeah, but I'm just, no, in terms of would he be getting drunk because he's putting it back into his body, right? And then peeing mm -hmm. it out. It's a good question. Depends if it's been absorbed, right? Yeah. But that is disgusting. He's peeing into people's mouths wine. Mm -hmm. Oh, now I get it. Human decanter. You're never going to look at a glass of red wine again, are you? You're going to be like, who poured this wine? And is and this out of this wine? Get my glass. Is this the reason he has the UTI? Yeah, because he's caught an infection. Oh, of course. Sorry, I, I kind of got sidetracked with why he was there in the first place. Mm. So I'm not sure. Did he get the infection? Because she relayed the detail that. Rather than peeing into a glass, he would pee into people's mouths. So that made me question, is that how he caught the infection? Because he was also getting a bit of, you know, adult fellatio at the same time. Oh, I don't know with that. I mean... It's got to be from that wine going into his bladder with... And remember, that's all like fermenting stuff, right? And then coming out again. And what kind of part... What's this actually a really civilised dinner party what like uh an election party or something for like a bunch of politicians it would not surprise <laughs> and he just like pulled down his pants and like fills up a glass and then just kept you know it has to be some kind of refill anyone yeah exactly it has to be some kind of fetish thing but the fact that it's red wine makes me think that it's an upscale upmarket kind of event because if it was a fetish club it would just be vodka red bull right <laughs> i don't know if there's anything upmarket about this if i'm honest well, it depends. I think it's just the surrounding. What What is he wearing? Right, where is he? Is he in a nice kind of penthouse suite? Number floor number 55? I mean, I imagine his friends that perhaps didn't know that he did this and they go around and they do find out and they're like, oh, I've been going around Steve's this whole time and every time he serves red wine and they never see the bowl. That's true. Yeah. What vintage is this? Well, I was born in uh, 1985. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's disgusting. It is pretty gross. I hope I never come across this person. What have you got for me? So this week, um, there is a singer who I think you pronounce her name, Brocarde? Brocard? Um, so, sorry, Brocard. 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 She's a songwriter and performer from Oxfordshire. Mm -hmm. And she's made the news headlines this week because she's going through a divorce to a ghost. She's married a ghost. She married a ghost back in October 2022. Uh, okay. And there's a video or a sort of image of them getting married. And by that, there's her in an empty space. Go on. Um, so she got married and everything was going well. But I think apparently on, on their sort of wedding night, um, the ghost bumped into Marilyn Monroe. Um, so she just turned up at this church. In England. Are you go so, hang on wait. Are you gonna tell me that the ghost husband of hers cheated on her with Madeleine Monroe? Is that where this is leading? Well, apparently he became like really fascinated with her and uh, <laughs> the funniest thing is um 
she says that um, her husband disappeared for days. Uh, okay. As a ghost. Okay. A game back spelling right. of Chanel number five. Right. <laughs> this woman does not need a divorce. She needs to be sectioned. And she needs to be sectioned now. I just love the fact that she disappeared and she's like, I can't find them anywhere. Um, so anyway, apparently his his Amazing. personality changed, and um, after that, um, yes, was she, it working late and stuff? Well, I don't know, but she went to the chapel where they got married, and she ordered an exorcism from her mind, um, and so she just announced their split in her song called "Just Another Anthem." Why are people? So um, yeah, that's my news for this week. Great. Great one. <laughs> I'm really disturbed by that. <laughs> where did you get where did you get the story? Was this one one of those stories at the very bottom of kind of the article, you know, where, where all the clickbait stuff is? No, this is this is um a reputable news source. Which one? It wasn't the mirror or the daily mail. Was it the telegraph? Uh, no. Why would it be the telegraph? Telegraph's a respectable newspaper, right? Yeah. But um I don't know, maybe I'll collate some of these and make a nice little roundup of weird news from the week. I think that would be great. Yeah. Great. So, should we get on with uh, topic of the week? Yeah, let's go back to that. So, in today's episode of The Compendium, I'm going to be telling you about an awesome woman who carved her name into the history books by daring to do something that no man at the time believed a woman could do. You know, just in case you got a period and stuff. Her name is Amelia... Earhart. Ah, the famous pilot. What do you know of Amelia? Well, she's a famous pilot. Um, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and I can't remember when she was around, but I know that she was one of the first persons to fly around the world, right? Well, actually, she wasn't the first person to fly around the world. Okay. Other people had done it before. Mm-hmm. She was for sure the first woman to do this. Yep. But also, this was going to be the longest route ever taken oh, okay. on a circumnavigation around the globe. She was going to kind of like hug the equator. Right. So it was going to be like 29,000 miles of something like that. Oh, I see. So she's going around the middle of the Earth or close to the middle of the Earth. As close as she could, yeah. Before it was perhaps more towards the North Pole. Yeah. Right, with you. What else do you know of her? Um, well, I don't know if this is going to go into spoiler territory. I'll say it anyway. Go on. No. Um, well, she goes missing. Well, that's what this whole thing is about. That's the title of the show. Oh, okay. I know you, you don't see the titles just yet until we go live, but yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know how you were going to like uh, tell the story. Well, she's gone missing. Mm-hmm. And famously, no one knows where she's gone. No. But that's what this story is all about. Okay. So today's episode is a dive into the disappearance of of this incredible aviator who became lost during her attempt to circumnavigate the globe. Now, Amelia Earhart's name is not only synonymous with her achievements, but also one of the most captivating mysteries of the 21st century. Today, I'll be telling you about what happened on that fateful day in 1937 when she and her navigator, Fred Noonan, Noonan? Noonan? Noonan, simply vanished near Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean we will explore the extensive search operation that was undertaken as a result and why no conclusive trace of the duo was ever found. We will also touch upon the numerous communication issues they encountered along their journey and how these could have been avoided as well as the speculation around this seemingly spontaneous change in their flight path. Okay. We will also discuss the potential artefacts connected to Amelia that were found over the years their authenticity, and the ongoing debate surrounding this incredible mystery. So Adam, let me tell you the story of Amelia Earhart. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. So I think, of course, we need to first start with who Amelia Earhart is. Okay. And I'm going to, this is going to be like a bit of a flyby kind of journey through her life up until the really interesting bit. Right. So we won't go through too much detail. I'll tell you about all the main kind of milestones in our life. And then we will just get straight to the juicy bit. The juicy bit. Okay, so we're not going to learn about what grade she got at school. Well, we might learn a little bit about what she did at school, but we'll see. Okay. 
So she was born on July 24th, 1897 in a modest town of Atchison in Kansas. Not sure where that is. But her parents were Edwin and Amelia Earhart. For most of Amelia's life, her father Edwin struggled professionally and also battled as an alcoholic. Although their relationship at times was challenging, they did relatively remain close throughout her life. Mm -hmm. So as a child, Amelia was known for her tomboyish behaviour, which was not discouraged by her mother. Along with her younger sister Grace, the two were constantly out on adventures, spending long hours playing, climbing trees, hunting rats with a rifle, and like what they call belly slamming a sled, kind of like downhill. So the pair were like really encouraged to be fiercely independent. Okay. Now in 1904, inspired by a roller coaster that she saw at a fair in St. Louis, Amelia cobbled together with the help of her uncle, a homemade kind of version of this roller coaster. Now she secured the ramp to the roof of the family tool shed and slid down the ramp in like this weird wooden box, which she had kind of like fashioned using kind of roller skates and things like that which then smashed into the ground with her on board. Luckily, she escaped with only like a little bruised lip, a torn dress, but a sensation of exhilaration. <laughs> this was the moment. <laughs> this was her calling. She sounds very much like a, um, I don't mean this in a negative way, but more like maybe like a tomboy or someone that was a bit more, I don't know. Yes. So this. she, from the day that she was born, she broke those kind of gender boundaries that were kind of like, typically expected of a young little girl. So she definitely was a tomboy, and that's a really fair assessment. Okay. So when she then crashed her little roller coaster, what she exclaimed was, oh, it's just like flying. And now historians would obviously like to joke that this was the moment that Amelia took her first documented flight. Don't know if it's an actual flight, but no, I can see how this kind of... Flying through the air. Yeah, okay. (laughs) So in 1907, at the age of 10, Amelia would see her first ever aircraft at the Iowa State Fair. Now, her father tried to persuade her to kind of hop into the pilot seat. But at the time, just one look at this, what she described as this rickety flyver was enough for Amelia to be just like, nope. So it hadn't quite caught on just yet. Mm -hmm. Still got a bit more time to go. But in 1914, sadly, Amelia's grandmother suddenly died, leaving her huge substantial estate in a trust for the girls. Now, the death of a grandmother was a massive blow to Amelia at this time since they were extremely close. Now, Amelia describes this stage of her life as essentially the end of her childhood. So it's a bit sad. So in 1915, Amelia developed an interest in science and was inspired by females in the field, keeping like a little scrapbook with various newspaper clippings about successful women, not just in science, but also predominantly in other male orientated fields. Mm -hmm. So even from the very get go, like in her teenage years, she was always thinking about how she can kind of break those kind of gender barriers Mm -hmm. um, and achieve what other men were also achieving at the time. Those, her gender wasn't something that was kind of going to be holding her back at all. No, it doesn't sound like she wanted to settle what was expected of her she wanted to do what she wanted to do exactly now after graduating high school at the start of world war one she decided to visit her sister in toronto and this is where amelia saw many wounded soldiers returning back from the battlefields and of course determined to help at this time she decided that she was going to train as a nurse's aide for the red cross and at the time her duties were rudimentary at best they included preparing food in the kitchen and handing out prescribed medications. It's here that Amelia became captivated by stories from military pilots and subsequently sparked that true kind of interest in flying. Mm -hmm. Now, when the outbreak of Spanish flu raged through 1918, Amelia sadly got sick and was hospitalized for two months. Two months, wow. Yeah, yeah. Her symptoms were so bad, though, that it took her a full year before she fully recovered. And as a result of catching the flu, she developed that kind of this chronic satitis, which would significantly affect her kind of flying activities throughout the rest of her life, Um, often having to kind of undergo like major surgeries, which were really, really painful. So she really suffered from kind of the the long life symptoms of 
the flu that she caught in 1918. Well, just a bit like long COVID and that kind of thing. Exactly. That's the first thing that came to mind as well. So, And the fact that it took her a whole year to recover was crazy. Mm. And that wasn't that unusual from what we went through as well. No. So it was about this time that Amelia visited an airfield with her friend. One of the highlights of the day was a flying expedition put on by a World War I veteran pilot. Now, during the show overhead, the pilot spotted Amelia with her friend spectating from this kind of isolated clearing. And he decided that he was going to dive at them, right? Just to impress the crowds. Right, okay. So Amelia says she refused to back down. She says, I'm sure he said to himself, let me, let me make them scamper. <laughs> so Amelia just stood her ground. And as the aircraft came close, she says, I didn't understand it at the time, but I believe that little red aeroplane said something to me that day as it swished by. And so this is the moment that starts her love affair with flying. It said something. What did it say to her? I don't know. Come, it, come fly with me. Come fly with me. Hey, come fly with me. Maybe sing a little song, a serenade. Show. I don't know. But yeah, I think it's maybe more the exhilaration of it, right? Something's right. coming crashing towards her. She's staring into its face, into the face of danger. There's something quite attractive about that. I guess it shows the daredevil in her um, and that she's up for some adventure. Yeah, I think you can draw a parallel between what happened here at the air show versus what happened when she kind of crashed her little weird little mini roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Exhilarating, she found it. Yeah. So there could be something in there. Or maybe it's just a nice little story to tell when people say, hey, how did you get into flying? And she goes, well, I was at an air show. And well, all might be true, but maybe she kind of attached more significance to it than yeah. there actually was, you know. Just a bit like what Ty Warner did when they asked him, like, what made you go into plush? And he was like, this big old plushy bear arrived in a dream to me and told me I needed to go into plush. And that, it's a story, right? Right. And the, oh, yeah, that, that's right. And that's how we created the Beanie Babies. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's something like that. Everyone needs an origin story. Yeah. What's your origin story? Um, Mommy and Daddy, they met. They liked each other. They held hands. Nine months later, I was born. No, I'm still working out my origin story. Okay. We'll see. Hopefully, it's good. Yeah. Well, it'll be a good one. You'll have a good origin story. So in 1920, Amelia and her father attend an aerial meet in Long Beach, California. Now, at this aerial meet, there's kind of like this amusement passenger flight kind of ride thing that's taking place, but it's an actual real aeroplane itself. You pay like $10 for 10 minutes, and this has been offered to kind of visitors that are visiting this aerial meet. And Amelia says that by the time she had got two to 300 feet off the ground, she knew that she was going to be destined to fly for the rest of her life. $10 for 10 minutes. That seems quite a lot for back then. I think so, yeah. I think it is quite a significant amount. Yeah, that's like spending, I don't know, like £100 to go up in a, on a ride? Possibly. I don't think that's that unreasonable, do you? No, maybe not. I just felt that for the time, that seemed quite expensive. So the next month in January of 1921, Amelia recruited a woman called Netta Snook to be her flying instructor, paying $500 for 12 hours worth of training, which she pays off by working a variety of different jobs, including photography gigs, truck driving, and being kind of, I think it's called a, a stenographer at like a local telephone company. What's a stenographer? I think it's where you're like pulling out one plug wire and putting into the next one and connecting people to different kind of oh. connection things, I think. What are those fancy lady exchange people that would I felt like that came a lot later than then I don't know I could be wrong I'm not quite sure remember this is just the compendium it may or may not be true it may or may not be true so yeah it's something like that okay stenographer wonderful word so when her lessons start she is literally amazing straight away so much so that six months later Amelia buys a second-hand bright chromium yellow plane, which she nicknames the Canary. At the time, she was super keen to look the part. So she decides at this point to cut all of her hair real short. She buys herself a new leather flying coat. And because she's getting teased for being like the new kid, she decides that she is going to sleep in this leather coat 
to wear it in and then she will deliberately kind of like drizzle her aircraft oil all over it to get it really stained and worn in things okay. like that oh so it just it looks too new you like when you sometimes get a, uh, a pair of white trainers and they're just too bright and sometimes you just need Ooh, well 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 if you get a pair of white trainers you keep them white actually i have a great story to tell you okay so i went into jd j is a jd sports right to buy that pair of Reeboks that I bought a few weeks ago. And I went in and I looked through the sale rack and I was like, great, a pair of Reeboks, 35 quid, reduced from 65, great, great deal. So I asked the guy if I could have those in whatever my size and not telling my size, my shoe size online. It's because they're really small. And I was like, I really like these. I'll take these. No problem. And he said, would you like any? What did he ask me? He said, I can't remember what he called them. He asked me if I wanted like these little plastic things to go in the inside of the shoe right and i was like what is that for and he was like it means that when you're walking you won't develop that crease along the front of the foot they do that now yeah and i was like no i don't i don't need that and then he was like okay would you like any kind of hydrophobic kind of spray for sealant for the shoe so like dirt will just rub off i'm like who was buying this stuff Guess this is this is what's important to our kids these days. Yeah, they are all into shoes and trainers, man. They call them kicks, kicks, kicks. Oh, but yeah. So I was like, no, I'll just take the thirty-five pound trainers, please. Yeah, you did say that was going to be an interesting story, though. Fuck you. <laughs> so later that year in 1922, she is smashing all kinds of records, and she's even smashing some of her own records that she had previously set. The most notable one was flying the Canary to an altitude of 14,000 feet, which set the world record for a female pilot. And on the 16th of May 1923, just a year later, Amelia becomes the 16th woman in the United States to be issued with a pilot's license. She is totally amazing at this point. Oh, wow. But one thing that I did find fascinating is that she's not really the pioneer in this area in terms of on the female side of things there's loads of female pilots yeah it sounds like there's there's certainly more than um maybe i would have thought but she's not like unique in that sense that's right she just becomes possibly the most famous mm -hmm. just by happenstance just by pure luck hey it could be her tenacity her her kind of nerve her talent a jacket a jacket, all these different things, but she just ends up becoming one of the most famous and one mm -hmm. of the most celebrated, and also possibly because of this story as well. Mm -hmm. But sadly, throughout the early 1920s, following what is considered a disastrous investment in a failed gypsum mine, Amelia's inheritance from her grandmother was almost completely gone. Now, she's completely broke at this point, and she is forced to sell the canary as well as several other, obviously, assets. And sadly, flying for her at this point had to be put on hold. So in 1924, following her parents' divorce, she relocates to Boston, Massachusetts from California, where she starts to work as a teacher and a social worker. As a social worker, Amelia really feels like she's truly giving back to the community and she's genuinely gaining this fulfillment from the job and decides that maybe she's going to give this a go as a career, right? So flying is kind of like a done dream for her now. Mm -hmm. She does, however, maintain an interest in aviation, but for her as a career or as something that she's going to pursue, she just doesn't have the time or the money. But in her spare time, she becomes a member of the American Aeronautical Society's Boston chapter. The big long-ass name for it, whatever that is. It's not that catchy, I'll be honest, but hey. No. Eventually, she gets elected to vice president. Now, with the very little money that she does have, she decides to invest this into a brand new airport that's been built in the area. Once it's built, she becomes the first person to take off from this airport in 1927. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I think it's cool. Now, Amelia wrote for a local newspaper column as well, promoting kind of flying, which resulted in her becoming a bit of a minor celebrity. So I think kind of these were the building blocks that really catapulted her into fame as well. The fact that she was already kind of a little bit well known. Now, around this time, a guy called Charles Lindbergh. Do you recognize that name? Lindbergh. It sounds a little German. Is that right? Lindbergh? No? I guess it, it sounds like a, a Germanic name. 
Yeah, I was thinking of the hot air balloon, not the hot air balloon. No, ah, right, that's the Hindenburg. Oh, the Hindenburg. Which is German, and I think, I wouldn't be surprised if his name was German as well, but this guy was famously the father of the Lindbergh baby. Oh, I don't... Missing? No, what's that? I mean, a baby that went missing. It's a baby that went missing. Right. Really famous. It's it's on my list to do. Okay. As an episode, you're going to love it. So, we'll just put a back little in the box, put that back in, save it for Linda. Put a pin in that. So Charles had just completed a solo flight across the Atlantic, which made big news across the world. Now, following this, a woman called Amy Guest was primed to be the first female to fly across the Atlantic. But after some deliberation, she decided that the trip was way too dangerous for her. So while at work one afternoon in April in 1927, Amelia gets a phone call from Captain Hinton H. Riley who asks if she would like to replace Amy and fly across the Atlantic instead. So at this point, she's like not primed to do any of this stuff, right? She is... I was going to say, she's been a social worker and all this. I know she's been investing and she did take off, but she, um, from the airport, it doesn't sound like she's been doing a lot of this. It's exactly right. She hasn't. And she was looking to pretty much build a career as a social worker, which she was getting all the fulfillment from. Mm -hmm. So at the time... Like I said, Amelia was building this career, which she absolutely adored, but this opportunity for her was too great to pass on. So in 1928, Amelia Earhart becomes the first female passenger of a transatlantic flight with a, with a pilot being William like Stoltz, who's a really, really famous pilot. He's kind of next to kind of Charles Lindbergh. Since she had no training in instrument flying, her role during the flight would be to mainly keep flight logs. And so the flight departs from Newfoundland in an aeroplane called Friendship. And after 20 hours and 40 minutes, they finally land in South Wales in the UK. And they don't have probably, I mean, this is this is worse than economy, I'd imagine. 20 hours in an airplane, mm. can't play for back. No one's coming up with like some snacks. No. They're in-flight entertainment. Maybe not even a toilet. No, they must have like a bottle or something, right? Just mm-hmm. idiot. Yeah. A she-wee. Wow. Yeah, I would not want to do this. No. No. But hey, these are the pioneers of the time, right? Yeah, good for them. So when she gets home to the United States on July the 6th, Amelia was a full-blown celebrity. Because Amelia had an uncanny resemblance to Charles Lindbergh, she was dubbed Lady Lindy by the media. And in an interview about this, essentially, this huge achievement, she candidly refers to herself as simply a sack of potatoes. Because all she was was just a passenger, really. So this remark is interesting because it's a subtle indication of her desire to make the flight as a pilot in her own right rather than just the log keeper. Yeah, it sounds like she didn't really take that much um I guess satisfaction or kind of like an accomplishment from that. Yeah, she did it. That's great, but that's not hers. Sure. And and I guess it's because she knows that she can fly at 14,000 feet, right? And she's broken all these records. So why wouldn't she feel like that? Yeah. It's just because she's a woman in a way that's the only thing that's holding her back. Yeah. Like she can do that. She She's done similar things before. Mm. So with her newfound international fame, Amelia teams up with publicist George Putman who works to book Amelia on an exhaustive lecture tour. She ends up publishing a book and getting multiple endorsement deals for like products like luggage, cigarettes, and clothing. Now, the entire endorsement of the new luggage line was a huge deal at the time because Amelia introduced a new innovative form of luggage specifically targeted at women. And it was the weekend bag. The weekend bag? Yeah. You have weekend bags. Yeah, but I didn't realize that was specifically targeted at women. Well, this is why. Now, this might seem trivial now, but this marks a really profound shift from kind of the conventional large, extremely heavy trunks that women typically used, which were usually heavy and difficult to carry around, right? Especially without the assistance of a man. <laughs> so Amelia's weekend bag would establish a new precedent for female kind of autonomy, which on her part, was completely deliberate. She really was a pioneer of feminists in all the most unexpected ways. 
So her celebrity status brings bags of cash and really big friendships. One notable friendship was Eleanor Roosevelt, which at the time was the first lady of the United States. So they meet at a White House event in 1933, and both women are known at this time for, of course, their independence, their courage, and their commitment to women's rights. Right. So they hit it off almost immediately. What's cool is that after dinner, Amelia suggests that they go for a nighttime flight, and Eleanor agrees, and the two women sneak off in their ball gowns, and they fly from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, and then back again. That's really cool. So, like, oh, let's ditch this party. Let's go for a, a spin. Yeah. Plane. Let's ditch this joint, man. Yeah. That's let's cool. go to Speakeasy. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what they do? Let's go flappery. Flappery. I don't know if that's. Oh, well, that's what. Oh, flapper girls. Yeah, they're little flapper girls. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you hadn't already guessed, Amelia is flying. But she always looked for different opportunities to shoehorn in different ways to kind of progress kind of female equality. So, she accepted a position as associate editor for Cosmopolitan magazine. Can you believe? Have you heard of Cosmopolitan? Yeah, of course. Yeah, my sister reads that. Yeah, I can't I, believe it's been going that long. I didn't realize it's almost a hundred. Oh well, no, it is a hundred years. Well, I don't know how old it was at this point. Oh, okay, but yeah, yeah. If let's assume it started in nineteen twenty. Yeah. So yeah, a hundred uh, years. Well. So she starts writing for the Cosmopolitan magazine, which she turns into one of those opportunities to kind of really advance kind of female kind of equality and campaigning for greater public acceptance of aviation, specifically focusing on roles for women kind of entering the field. Now that she was the first person to fly as a passenger across the Atlantic, Amelia really wanted an untarnished record of her own. So Amelia set out to become the first woman to fly solo across North America and back. Also, around this time, in 1929, she kind of dabbled in competitive air racing, which is essentially like a derby. Do you know what a derby is? I guess so. I kind of thought my first image is like uh, drag racing. Exactly, yeah. So basically, there's a bunch of women kind of that race from Santa Monica to Cleveland, earning the event nickname the Power Puff Derby Girls. Oh, okay. Derby Girls. But essentially, it's that. But it's an all-female event. Now, the Power Puff... Derby girls, that's a derogatory term. That's not the official term for it. That's what's okay. pointed. So during this period, Amelia becomes involved with the 99s, which is an organization of female pilots from this particular Derby, which is aimed to provide moral support and advance the cause of women in aviation. She later, in 1930, becomes the organization's first president, and in 1934, when the Bendrix Trophy banned women from competing, she openly refused to, like, fly the film actress Mary Pickford to Cleveland, who was going to be opening up the races. So she even stood in protest against kind of people that were inhibiting kind of progress in the field, specifically for women. Mm -hmm. And that's just another example of how she would stand up to various oppressions. So over time, Amelia grew closer to her publisher, George P. Putnam, who proposed to her six times before he finally accepted. They married on the 7th of February in 1931, but on the condition that the marriage be known as a partnership with dual control. Oh, wow. So she was like, um, it reminds me of that Family Guy sketch with Sean Connery, that will you marry me? No. Will you marry me? No. And then he had to ask six times before she said yes. And even then she was like, actually, this isn't a marriage. This is a partnership. Yeah, I mean, good for her, but as interesting, that's very strong-willed, very, um, well, yeah, all the, I guess, the feminism associated with that. She, mm. she wasn't going to take any crap. No, she's not. And here is a letter that she actually wrote to him and delivered to George on the day of the wedding. This is what she wrote. Dear GPP, that's George P. Putman, there are some things which should be ripped before we are married. Things we have talked over before. Most of them. You must know that my reluctance to marry, my feeling that I shatter thereby chances in work which means most to me. I feel the move just now as foolish as anything I could do. I know there may be compensations, but I have no heart to look ahead. On our life together, 
I want you to understand, I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. Oh, so she wants to have an affair? She basically wants an open marriage. Oh. Gets better. If we can be honest, I think the difficulties which arise may be best avoided should you or I become interested deeply in anyone else. Oh, yes, she, she spelled it out there. Mm-hmm. Please let us not interfere with the other's work or play. Mm-hmm. Play. Or planes. Or planes. I think she meant play. Okay. Or play with planes. Oh, maybe she's attracted to planes. Maybe. Are we going to find out? Oh, she's a kinky bitch. Nor let the world see our private joys or disagreements. In this condition, I may have to keep some place where I can be by myself now and then. With her other men. With her other men. Mm -hmm. Or women. Oh, yep. Sorry. I assume. Shouldn't assume. I don't think there's any evidence that she was a lesbian. It would be great if she was. Other than the short hair, that's the only thing that she's got going. Yeah. The only clue. For I cannot guarantee to endure all the times and confinement of even an attractive cage. I must exact a cruel promise, and that is that you will let me go in a year if we find no happiness together. Oh, so she's got like a a breakout clause. This is probably one of the first prenups. Yeah, Mm. this is a contract. She's badass. Mm. Final line is, I will try to do my best in every way and give you that part of me you know and seem to want. A E. Oh, that's kind of a very strange. I mean, he's just getting that on the wedding day. Mm-hmm. On the wedding day. So I was, I'm hoping that she might have like dropped a few hints along the way to say she's not that interested. She'll give it a shot. She likes other people. But if he's just getting that on the wedding day. I'd be like, oh, I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with Amelia Earhart. And he gets that. I'd be like, oh. Oh. (laughs) But the thing is, though, I do think that if you look at the opening line of the letter, she said that these are things that we've talked about in the past anyway. Fine. So I think that he knows. And he completely agrees to all the conditions. And they get partnershiped up. Partnershiped up. Happy partnership. Mm. On the 20th of May, 1932, at the age of 34, Amelia sets off on a solo flight across the Atlantic. At this time, not as a passenger, but as the pilot, claiming the accolade to be the first woman to make the flight. Now, Amelia sets off from Newfoundland with the aim of landing in France, and the flight takes 14 hours and 56 minutes. But it touches down in a field near Derry in Northern Ireland in like a farm, a really super remote farm. So not quite France, basically. The landing was witnessed by a farmhand and when asked, have you flown very far? Amelia just replied, from America. And this guy was like, well, not from around here. No, it's probably with an Irish accent and a farmer accent. I guess that's, yeah, I guess. Why is a farmer Irish accent? Or I, I, I'm not even going to try say it. No, I don't think I can do it. I, I think can, all I can think of is potato. 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 But with the farmer, I don't know. It feels like the two things clash. I can't quite work it out. I'm mm. going to practice. We'll see. I'll I'll test you next week. Okay. And I guess also like if you were like a remote farmer and someone just landed, touched down in probably an airplane that you've probably not really seen too much of, and someone says I'm from America, like would a part of you think is it aliens? Is it aliens? You always love doing <laughs> that. Thing. So now, as the first woman to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic. Amelia receives the Distinguished Flying Cross from Congress, the Cross of the Knight of the Legion of Honour from the French government. What a name. Again, and all these catchy titles they have. I want to try to say it again. The Cross of the Knight of the Legion of Honour. And also, she also gets the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society from President Herbert Hoover. Right. So she got those two accolades for being the first woman to do it, which is great. Now, following this achievement, Amelia makes three more solo flights. The first, on January the 11th, 1935, she flies from Honolulu to Oakland, California. Then, in April of that same year, from Los Angeles to Mexico City. And then on May the 8th, she flies nonstop from Mexico City to New York, 
and she's just completely an international sensation. So she's super famous at this point. And between 1930 and 1935, Amelia also set several women's speed and distance aviation records in a variety of aircrafts. And by 1935, Amelia had set her sights on a prize to circumnavigate the Earth along this equator. Ah, okay. This is where this all starts. So Amelia contacts Hollywood stunt kind of aeroplane guy called Paul Mance, who helps train her, basically. And together they end up establishing a business partnership together, not one of those partnerships, just a pure business partnership, where they set up a flying school together. Now, in early 1936, Amelia starts planning a round-the-world flight. Although others have flown around the world already, her flight would be the longest at 29,000 miles, following closely to the equator as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. She secures funding and a Lockheed Electra 10E. This is an aircraft that is built to her specific specifications which includes extensive modifications to kind of the fuselage um, to incorporate additional fuel tanks and is basically dubbed the Flying Laboratory. Although publicized as a Flying Laboratory, very little science will actually happen on board. It's pretty much just the intention of flying around the world so she can gain enough material to write her next book. And then I think the idea is for her to retire. Sure. So she's looking for an end game. Yeah, well, and that, I don't know how you could beat that other than flying, like, what? vertically around the world. Yeah. To space and above. Yeah. 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 But that wouldn't happen until stinky old Elon Musk came along all these years later. What? Actually, no, that would be 69, wouldn't it? Yeah, I was going to say. Cut that out. <laughs> so Amelia starts pulling together her team that would join her on her trip, and Amelia chooses a guy called Captain Harry Manning as her navigator. He knows Morse code, which at the time was still the standard way of communicating in the Pacific region where the flight is due to kind of travel through. So he's really important to this flight, right? Okay. The original plan was a two-person crew. So Amelia would fly and Manning would navigate. But during a test flight with Manning, he conducted like a navigation fix, which puts them off course by 20 miles, which is completely acceptable. But... Sometime later, George decides that he wants to do another test of Manning's kind of navigation skills under poor navigational conditions. And again, Manning's position is off once again. But again, within that kind of acceptable kind of range. But to George, obviously that's his wife, and he wants to make sure like we have someone who is the best, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to get within a really kind of small margin of error. So concerned, George thought that it would be best to kind of extend the crew to have two navigators. And so a guy called Fred Newman is subsequently chosen as the second navigator due to his experience with celestial navigation of various aircrafts, which would be essential during part of the flight. Now, Noonan was also experienced in both marine and also flight navigation. And having established some of kind of pan and kind of seaplane routes across the Pacific, he was perfect for the job, right? Because he had that detailed experience. Now, Noonan had also been responsible for training pan-American kind of navigators for across routes between San Francisco and Manila. So he also had experience kind of through long-haul flights as well. So the original plans were for Noonan to navigate from Hawaii to Howland Island, which is a particularly difficult portion of the flight, where Manning would then continue with Earhart or Amelia Earhart to Australia, where she would then proceed on her own for the remainder of the project. So would they swap or would they like tag team? How did that work? I think they would just tag team. So the navigators are just going to be both in the back end, both flying on the plane itself. Okay, so they don't land. They're still on, constantly in the Oh, actually, that's a really good question. Yeah, do you think like Manning would then meet them somewhere like near Australia or something and then he would jump on board? That's possible. And would they have to land or would they have to like swap midair? Like almost like another plane comes along. No, well, the navigator is just telling you where to go, right? He's telling her, oh, like be a left kind of five degrees or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he has to be in the hot seat or anything like that. Okay. He can just command from, I don't know, the passenger seat, I guess. Yeah. Doesn't have to take the wheel. No, no, no. 
expect that, but yeah, okay. So on March the 17th, 1937, Amelia and her two navigators flew the first leg of their journey from California to Hawaii. And in Hawaii, an issue with propeller meant that the aircraft needed servicing. So after a three-day repair, the flight was ready to kind of resume towards Howland Island. So they're going anti-clockwise around the Earth. So they do land, obviously, to refuel and stop the rest. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're stopping. They're making loads of different legs across the across. Oh. Not that's not one single journey. That was the bit I was like, wow, that's impressive. But okay. I guess so. I guess if they weren't stopping, they'll be super impressive. But yeah, they're stopping for like days at a time sometimes. Oh, okay, fine. They have the repair and they're ready to kind of resume their flight to Howland Island in the Pacific. But due to other issues with something called kind of uh, uncontrolled ground loop, remember the compendium, don't need to know about it. The forward kind of landing gear ends up collapsing in kind of a nutshell. Um, and this happens on takeoff, which means that both propellers hit the ground and the plane skids on its belly with the aircraft getting like severely damaged. Now, the flight was then essentially called off and the aircraft was then shipped by sea to Lockheed in Burbank for further repairs. So they're out of action for a while and the journey's not even started. Now, Manning, having taken time off work due to the flight, meant that problems with the delay forced him to have to kind of pull out of the trip altogether. Mm. This is the guy that knows Morse code and the only one of them who knows Morse code. Okay. Detail. <laughs> now, basically, this means that it just leaves Amelia and Noonan, and neither of them were very skilled radio operators. So while the Electra was being repaired, Amelia and George secure more money and prepare for a second attempt. This time, they'll be flying west to east. And the change in direction was partly due to, obviously, changes in global wind and weather kind of patterns along the planned route. It's been a few months now, right? So on the second flight, Fred Noonan and Amelia were going to be the only crew and they would depart from Miami on June the 1st, and after several stops through South America, Africa, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia, they arrive on the 29th of June in Ley, and that is in New Guinea. Now, up to this point, they had already completed 22,000 miles of the journey and had just 7,000 miles left to cross the Pacific. Now, on July the 2nd, 1937, at 10 a.m. in the morning, Amelia and Noonan take off from Ley and head to Howland Island, which is essentially a flat slither of land, which is two kilometers long and about half a kilometer wide. So this leg of the journey would also be 2,556 miles in length. It's not the longest leg of the journey, but it's, it's, it's a long leg, right? maybe okay. the second or third longest. And the flying time would be around 20 hours. So that is quite a long time up in the air. It's a huge amount of time up in the air. So you're going to be really knackered off 20 hours, right? Yeah. There's no autopilot, I don't think. No, and like sleeping and just... Mm. How do they manage that? I guess they just do. Okay. Right? I guess they take a few days break in between and then they set off. Yeah. So they will be crossing the dateline as well. So accounting for the two-hour time zone difference and the date line crossing, they were due to arrive the morning of the next day, but still on the 2nd of July. Right. Because they're crossing over that weird from Wednesday to Thursday kind of thing in Australia. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. Yeah, you get it. Now, around about 3 p.m. lay time, Amelia reported her altitude as 10,000 feet, but they would reduce altitude due to thick clouds in the air. And around about 5 p.m., Amelia reports her altitude around about 7,000 feet and the speed of about 150 knots. Their last known position report was near the kind of what they call the Nuka Munu Islands, about 800 miles into the flight. Now, Noonan may have been able to do some kind of celestial navigation to determine his exact position, but when crossing the international date line, if this is not taken into account, this could set you off course by up to 60 miles, which is a huge problem when you are looking for an island that's just 500 meters wide. Oh, okay. So this is, uh, so how does it throw them off? Like just because of like they're looking at where the sun and everything at is. And so therefore, if you don't know that you're crossing into another day, essentially, 
that's going to skew the angle that you're turning. I'm, do you know what? That sounds like a great assessment. I'm assuming that's exactly what it is. Let's go with that. Let's go with my assumption. Yeah. So like by one, being off by one degree can set you off like by 60 miles. And obviously that continues to grow the further you go out. Yes, that makes sense. Now in preparation for them arriving in Howland Island, the US Coast Guard sent a patrol ship called the Itasca to the island. That's Howland Island. Now, the ship was used to ferry news reporters to the island. Remember, she is super famous. People are following her all around the world. Mm -hmm. So when she's arriving at all these locations, there's news crew there, right? Yeah, right. So she's a big deal. So like I said, the ship was used to ferry news reporters to the island, but it also had communication and navigation functions on board. And the plan was for the Itasca to communicate with Amelia's aircraft via radio and then transmit a radio homing signal. And then the ship would then use its boilers to create large columns of smoke that would then be seen over the horizon. So then Amelia could see that and then follow the homing beacon and then they would be able to kind of find their way to the island. Right, okay. All right? So it was there as a safeguard. Now, Electra did have radio equipment for both communication and navigation, but Amelia failed to establish two-way radio communication or radio locate with the Itasca. Now, experts think that after their accident during the first attempt, the communication and antenna may have been removed when it was being repaired or may have been damaged, but it's likely that it would have been removed because it was it was like specifically fitted for them. Okay. So they might not have necessarily known the significance of it or why it was important, etc. Why I'm just accidentally taking it off or whatever. That's what they think, yeah. There could be a number of other explanations, but they think that it, it might have been removed by mistake. Now, the Itasca could pick up a clear voice transmission from Amelia's plane, but she could not hear them. Okay, one way. Implying, exactly, implying that the aircraft's directional finder thingy was not functional. Now, the Itasca picked up Amelia's weather report, stating that it was cloudy and overcast at just before 5 a.m. on July 2nd. At 6.14 a.m., another call was received, stating that the aircraft was within 200 miles and requested that the ship use its direction finder to provide bearing to the aircraft, right? They're now like, where's the homing signal? Which which bit do we need to get to? Like, we're, we're ready, we're here. Now, Amelia began whistling into the microphone to provide kind of like a continual signal for Itasca to kind of home in on. It was at this point that the radio operator on Itasca realized that the system could not tune into kind of their aircraft's frequency. And when Amelia was around 100 miles away at 6.45 a.m., another call requesting bearing was received by the Itasca. And they, again, they could hear her, but communications could not be received by Amelia. Right. So she's just out there and she's like, shit, where are these people? Are yeah. we in the right place? I imagine like Noonan's freaking out. It's like, shit, have I got us off course or where are we? I was just about to say, I guess she's panicking around this point or at least so. being quite concerned. Yeah, that's it. I, I would be, I'd be petrified. Now, a task of radio log between 7.30 and 7.40 states, Amelia was northwest and running out of fuel with only about half an hour left. They can't hear us, but we can hear them and are sending on the frequency 3105. That's me extrapolating that message out because it's all written in shorthand. But essentially, that's what that log said. Another Itasca radio log at 7.42 states, Itasca, we must be on you now, but can't see you, but gas is running low. Being unable to reach you by radio, we are flying at 1,000 feet. Right. So she's low down. Again, at 7.58, another transmission from Amelia is received. And this is the loudest yet, indicating that they were like in the immediate area. So they send people out on board and they're looking around. They can't see anything. You would think they'd be able to hit here. I don't know, of some kind of pain mm -hmm. in the distance. Yeah, but they couldn't. She was, she just wasn't in the vicinity. Right. Still unable to communicate, the Itasca sends Morse code signals instead, which Amelia acknowledged receiving, but she said that she was unable to determine what they were saying. Mm-hmm. Because remember, she's not proficient in Morse code and neither is Noonan. Right. The last transmission at 8.43 seems to indicate that Noonan believed that they had reached Howland Island. 
The Itasca used her boilers to generate smoke, but Amelia apparently didn't see this, so they weren't at Howland Island. They must have been somewhere else. Right, okay. Now, sporadic signals were reported for up to four to five days after their disappearance, but none of these could be translated. What was frustrating was that after they went missing, many different other stations were kind of calling and sending out frequencies on the same frequency that she was in, because of course, this is now international news already. That must have just caused more confusion though, right? That's exactly it. It did. So some were by voice, some were by other signals, which meant that it was just difficult to know whose signal was who, right? Mm -hmm. So which signal was Amelia's? Yeah. But are they sure she was sending out a signal then, or they don't know that for sure? Well, they can make some kind of assessments based on the direction that some of the signals are coming from. They suspect that some of them were coming from the direction that where she would have been at, but they can't verify whether or not it was definitely her signal. Okay. Now, an hour following Amelia Earhart's final known message, a search was undertaken by the Itasca, searching towards the north and west of Howland Island. Unfortunately, nothing was ever found. And soon after, the US Navy joined the search, and they focus their search in an area around Howland Island as well. And the search areas encompass pretty much various lines of positions that were adjusted according to the alleged radio transmissions from Amelia. So they could kind of sense that she was coming in one direction. So they just kind of went down this way and thought maybe get ahead of it. Mm. And that should be in that area. But again, later efforts focus their search over a wider area. As far as kind of the deserted Garda Island, which we'll talk about in a minute. But... Again, nothing explicitly concrete was ever found. And the official search ended on the 19th of July, 1937, at a cost a whopping $4 million in 1920s money, making it at the time literally the most expensive and extensive search in US history at that time. So how many days were they searching for? It doesn't sound like a huge amount, like maybe like 15 days. 15 days and $4 million. Wow. Yeah. In total, the search covered a total of like, I think like 150,000 square miles. But the search was also heavily criticized for kind of their rudimentary kind of search techniques and odd assumptions that they had made. But yeah, that's it. She's gone. That's really sad. So it sounds like she potentially was at another island then or somewhere completely different. But if they've searched 150,000 square miles or whatever, Mm -hmm. then that's quite a big area. It's a huge area. Now, George Putman, obviously, that's her husband. He took it upon himself to kind of fund private searches after kind of the official one had ended, which involved kind of combing the Gilbert Islands and other nearby locations. But again, with no success, Amelia was just eventually and legally declared dead in absentia, I think they called it, on kind of the 5th of January 1939. So just a few years later. Mm. Because normally it's like seven years that you have to wait. But for some reason, there were special circumstances that meant that she could be declared dead earlier. And the thing is, though, George needed that to happen. Even though he didn't believe that she was dead, he knew that he could get her declared dead legally so he could get her money. Oh, right. So that he could, not for nefarious reasons, so he could use that money to, then to search. continue searching for her. Right, yeah. with you. Which is horrible, right? Like, I have to accept legally that my wife's dead in the hope that I can continue to search for her. Yeah, I mean, that's quite morbid. So if I went missing, you'd have to wait seven years before legally declaring I was dead. I think so. I don't know if that's the same in the UK, but there was certainly in this case, and I have heard that being said in the past. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good to that. So, Adam, what are some of the theories? She never flew the plane in the first place. Do you think? Yeah, it was a whole hoax. Women pilots? That's not a thing. Hey, what if she got her period? I don't think you do that. Oh, okay, no. Not a woman on how to do that. So, of course, there'd be loads of theories that would be presented on what may have happened to Amelia and Fred. Most historians prescribe to the crash and sink theory, but there are a number of other possibilities that have been proposed, including several conspiracy theories. So let's go through some of them now. Okay. So the crash and sink theory, the main theory here is that and also the one that is widely accepted is that they simply just ran out of fuel crashed into the sea and they died well that feels like the most logical considering there's so much sea 
It's either yeah. they crash into the sea or they crash into land. Mm -hmm. And so if they can't find a plane, probably in the sea. That's it. And again, the reason why this is the most likely theory is because the plane was equipped with just enough fuel for the journey with a little to spare to account for contingencies and other headwinds and actually just finding the island, spent a little bit of time finding the island. But the lack of radio contact with the Itasca meant they were, they were unable to determine the correct direction of the island, ultimately leaving them on their own and running out of fuel. Do you know that still makes me nervous when we fly today, when these airlines have just enough fuel, a little extra, to maybe do like a half an hour lap in the sky if they need to, and then that's it. Yeah. That just freaks me out to go like, Ooh. and I appreciate there's loads of airports around. When I say loads, <laughs> you know, they're scattered throughout the world. Yeah. That's no, I get it. I feel, I, I, I don't really think about it much, but I probably they, will now. Don't they sometimes like, oh, we need to get kind of let out some fuel over the sea because of, I don't know, they need to, they do that sometimes. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it could be, could be possible, but it seems very wasteful. Mm. Why not just kind of make sure you have enough? Because we know how long it's going to take to get somewhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they do that, but that still freaks me out knowing that mm. they could run out. Right. So the next theory that we have is the Gardner Island hypothesis. Now, this theory states that Amelia and Fred crash landed onto Gardner Island, which is now known as Nikumaroro. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. Yeah, beautiful island. Here's why. Here's why they think that. So when Amelia and Fred failed to locate Howland Island, they decided to travel south, southeast, which would have brought them near the Phoenix Island, including Gardner Island, about 350 miles away from Howland Island. And the reason why they think this is where they would have gone is because one of Amelia's last radio transmissions was received from 150 degrees in the direction of from Itasca, which basically somehow indicates that they were heading towards Gardner Island. Remember also, Noonan thought that he'd come across the island as well. Mm -hmm. He was like, we're, we're here. Yeah. So maybe they arrived at that. It is thought that they had landed on a flat strip of coral reef. Again, they think this because the distress signals received after they'd been classed as officially disappeared were very sporadic and tended to occur when the tide was low, which would indicate that the plane's radio equipment was only able to be used or accessed when it was not submerged by high tides. Oh. Interlesting? 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 The signals eventually stopped, possibly when high tides finally washed the plane off of the reef. Right, so they're stuck on this island, the plane's gone, and, well, yeah, they're stuck on the island. Yeah, so this is kind of comes under the, the Gardner Island slash castaway theory. And did they ever search the island? Yes, the Navy planes did carry out kind of an assessment of the island, and they did see some signs of recent habitation on Gardner Island shortly after Amelia's disappearance. Three years later, in 1940, excavators on the island found a human skull and bones, along with a shoe, a sextant box, sex, sextant box, um, a bottle, which they say was freckle lightning cream, which may have been something that Amelia would have used. Okay. However, initial analysis of the bones found that they likely belonged to a male. But later reanalysis disputes this, pointing to the potential of them being female of European descent. So, or could it have been Noon Noonan? Could be. I did think that, but I don't know why no one connected those dots. Yeah. Because Noonan is a man. And they're just because they saw freckle lightning, mm -hmm. lighting creep. Um, is that, so she took that, did she take that with her on the plane? They say potentially. Potentially. I try and look at pictures of her and like, was she freckly? She kind of looked freckly, but there was no evidence that she was freckly. Right. But... It's possible. Okay. Also, when you think you're in the air for 20 hours at a time, right? Could it be sun cream? Yeah. Is that what freckle cream is? It just seems like a weird thing to take with you if you're going on a trip around the world. And it's very, it's not like, you, like we talked about. It's not a mm -hmm. comfortable journey. It's a kind of necessity. It's a 
an adventure. Yeah, you take your toothbrush and that is it. Yeah. So later expeditions to Gardner Island have discovered other artifacts, which have included various improvised tools indicating that someone was living on this supposedly uninhabited island. Mm. They found an aluminum panel and a piece of plexiglass, as well as a woman's size nine shoe heel. Okay. Now, photos show Amelia wearing the same type of shoe just days before she disappeared. Right. What is interesting is that the aluminum panel found does align with the dimensions and the rivet pattern, which is visible on some of the photos of Amelia standing next to her plane. Okay. Which these were taken shortly after her departure. The next theory that we have is the Japanese capture theory. Interesting one. This theory is based on several factors. First, in 1966, a book claimed that Amelia and Fred were captured and executed on the island of Saipan or the Marshall Islands. Now, although Saipan is over 2,700 miles away from Howland Island, it's unlikely that Amelia's plane would have made it this far like, after running so low on fuel because they only had like exactly the, the right amount. Mm-hmm. Now, with that said, though, even though it seems unplausible, a Saipanese woman says that she saw Amelia get executed by Japanese soldiers on the island. And another guy called Henry Kaiser Andre proposed an alternative version to the Japanese capture theory, which suggests that the Japanese shot down Amelia's plane. But when they investigated into the supposed site where this happened, like nothing of significance was found. Right, okay. Now, in 2017, a History Channel documentary called Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, presented a photograph from the National Archives as potential proof of Fred's capture. And this is that picture here so from what you can see in this picture is sitting on the deck with her back towards us you can see a woman kind of looking off to the right hand side looking towards that ship can you oh see yeah that? yeah so people suspect that maybe that is amelia Earhart on this island and then right where the pole is just here right there is a man that could be seen and people speculate that maybe that there is fred newman Okay, yeah, I can't quite work out. Yeah, you can't really tell who they are. The only yeah. thing that could be plausible here is that woman sitting on that deck. We assume it's a woman. I don't even know because that could be someone wearing a white blouse or it could be a man with no shirt on. True. I mean, it looks like a white person. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that I could probably... With short hair. With short hair. Yeah. Dark short hair. Now, this photo has since been discredited because the photo has been traced back to a Japanese travel guide from 1935, which is two years before Amelia disappeared. Right, okay. But this picture is super famous and it's been making the rounds for years. It's finally now been discredited. Oh, right. So that was a rumor, but recently been discredited. Okay. That's right. Fine. Now, overall, of course, I don't buy this theory and neither do many people nowadays anyway, only because of the huge distance between the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands and Howland Island, which is over a 1,000 miles away. That's the Marshall Islands. And then Saipan is over 2,000 miles away. Also, if the Japanese had discovered a crash plane, then rescuing Amelia, many people say, would have brought them considerable acclaim. So executing her and Fred just doesn't make sense to many people. You'd think they'd have got money or something. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here are some more conspiratorial theories around Amelia Earhart's disappearance, which naturally, as the name suggests, they aren't widely accepted, but they are interesting in their own right. First up, we have spies for Franklin D. Roosevelt. This theory suggests that Amelia Earhart was a spy for Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration gathering intelligence on Japanese in the Pacific. It turns out that its origin is actually from a World War II era movie called Flight for Freedom, set in 1943, which is a story of a fictional female aviator, obviously inspired by Earhart, who engaged in a spy mission within the Pacific. The movie naturally helped further the myth-slash-theory that Amelia was spying on the Japanese in the Pacific. So this film gets released years after she goes missing. They take inspiration from her story. That then becomes known in the zeitgeist, and then all of a sudden, that's what happened to her. Okay. There's also another 
quite a popular theory for a long time, and even George Putman potentially believed this, but they believe that she was a Tokyo Rose. Now, this rumor says that after being captured by the Japanese, she was forced into making propaganda radio broadcasts as a Tokyo Rose during World War II. Now, the Tokyo Roses were English-speaking female broadcasters who worked for Japanese radio stations during World War II. Now, these broadcasters were tasked with delivering propaganda messages and attempting to demoralize Allied troops in the Pacific. And Amelia, after being captured, was said to have been forced into being one of these women. However, George Putman spent personally loads and loads of times listening to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these different broadcasts. Right. And he never, ever recognized her voice at all. I can't imagine, just based on what we've learned from her in this episode, that she would ever agree to do that. She's quite strong-willed. I just imagine she would reject that because she's like, I'm not being forced to do that. I'd rather die. Yeah, I think she would. Yeah, I think I agree with you there. Yeah, but I think no no man's going to force her to put out fake propaganda. Mm. So another theory, coined the New Britain theory claims that Amelia may have turned back during her flight and attempted to reach an airfield in kind of a place called Rubal, which is New Britain, which is not that far away from kind of Ley. Right? So she went back. This, again, is 2,300 miles away. And an Australian army veteran who was famous in his own right doing stuff claimed that he'd witnessed a wreck resembling Earhart's plane. The subsequent searches failed to kind of find the wreckage at all. But again, considering Amelia Earhart's aircraft only had enough fuel for that single leg of the journey, there's just no way that she managed to get back to pretty much lay. So scrap that one as well. This one's an interesting one. Now finally, there is a theory that suggests that Amelia survived her world flight and assumed a new identity as a woman called Irene Craigmile Bolin. And she ended up relocating to New Jersey, where she then ended up getting remarried. Right, Interesting okay. theory. And it goes something like this. Amelia's plane went down, and she and Fred were captured by the Japanese, and the Japanese decided that they were going to use the pair as an opportunity to negotiate a prisoner exchange with the U.S. Now, the U.S. has a very strict non-negotiation policy with the enemy or terrorists. Right. But Amelia, being so beloved and so famous, conveniently also, she was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the president at the time. The government decides that they're going to proceed with negotiations for a prisoner exchange under the condition that Amelia and Fred would assume brand new identities. And in Amelia's case, she would assume the identity of Irene Craig Malboda. So the... U.S. don't want to publicize that they're going to, you know, they're entertaining this idea and, you know, um, but what I don't get is why would, why would they need a new identity? Well, because I think what it does is it sets a precedent, right? If they're seen to be negotiating with the enemy in one instance, what's there now stopping, let's say, the Russians from doing something similar right. when America wants to kind of set this precedent that they do not negotiate with terrorists and that is that deterrent in itself don't even try it because we won't entertain it but because she was such close friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and also she was so beloved and so famous they decided to make the exception but on the condition that yes she can have her life Eleanor Roosevelt can get a friend back but she'll have to assume a new identity but surely the Japanese would then like publicize oh we just released I yeah but they could just debunk it right yeah, but it has a... Yeah, I don't know. It's a theory. This is a newspaper clipping from um, the Evening News in Newark, New Jersey on Tuesday, November the 10th, 1970, which claims that that woman on the right-hand side is the real Amelia Earhart. What do you reckon? Do you reckon there is the side-by-side comparison? What do you think? Do you think there's a resemblance? Did she come forward with this or did... Um, this is just someone putting two and two together. I think, well, from what I read, from what I remember, this woman was hounded for decades. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a similarity, you know, she's she's gotten older, it could be her. 
in terms of the look, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't know. There's, I don't really buy it. It's an interesting story, hmm. but I don't buy that based on that picture. Yeah. Documentation of Bolin's personal life history and forensic analysis of the photos basically suggests that this theory is ultimately bullshit. Oh. So, but I, it is a good story. You keep giving me all these theories that we keep going, no, that doesn't sound right. Here's my favorite one. Okay. The crab theory. The crab, she was eating my crabs. Yeah. Oh. So, this is related to the castaway theory that says that the pair crashed on Gardner Island and survived. But they were overcome by crabs after becoming exhausted from fending off these giant coconut crabs on the island and eventually overpowered and then eaten. Have a look at these pictures. I want you to describe this for me. I know that you're a bit grossed out by crabs. Oh, what do you God, think? It's disgusting. Of that. It's too big. It's too big to be a crab. Do you want to describe what you're looking at there? It looks like a hand, a giant hand on a bin. But it's a crab on a bin. How big is the bin? It's uh, maybe like a meter high. And the crab is the length of the bin. It's a huge crab. Um, didn't they have a Game of Thrones episode where there's some crabs? Oh, the crab man on the, was it not one of the most recent one, the House of the Dragon? Yeah, that's it. That's mm. it. That's kind of, so they were eaten or tried to be eaten. Um, oh, it's man, it's huge. They're the size of a dog. Yeah, they're massive, aren't they? They look Oh, the so man crabs. holding it. Why is he holding it? Look at it. It's disgusting. Massive. Here's a smaller one next to a coconut. Well, actually, that's what the next theory is going to suggest. Right. Get this. Another variation of this theory suggests that Amelia and Fred may have been devoured by millions and millions of tiny red Christmas island crabs. These crabs literally move in swarms. And you may have even seen a documentary with David Attlebrough talking about these crabs trying to kind of cross the road and their cars right over them, but there's millions and millions of them and they're just all tiny little red crabs. One guy is on camera saying that when these crabs move, it's very disorientating because it feels like the ground is literally moving eerily Mm -hmm. below your feet as these kind of crabs slowly move in unison along the ground, literally eating everything in their path. Right. They did a test using a pig to see how quickly a swarm of these red crabs could pick clean a corpse. And it took 12 days. And as soon as they smell food, they start slowly coming towards the smell, like a red crabby lava. Even um, like live food? Live food. Oh, you so they will open up the cooler oh. box and then all of a sudden you would just see these crabs that would change direction. Oh. Coming at you really slowly in slow motion. Creepy. That is very creepy. Now, while it is true that Christmas Island may have vast colonies of these crabs, they are not native to Gardner Island. Or are there any of these crabs on any of the nearby islands? Gardner Island is over 5,300 miles from Christmas Island, which is in the Indian Ocean. So again, I'm sorry if you've heard this theory before and you believe it and it sounds most plausible to you, it's complete bullshit. These crabs, they don't live on Gardner Island. So the crab theory is bogus. Okay. So what have we got left with then? So. She crashed into the water. That is the story of Amelia Earhart. Uh, so I didn't realize about the theories of where she could have ended up. But um, yeah, it's a, I mean, it that second theory of her potentially hiding out on the island with the mm. metal foil plane or whatever part, that that one feels like if there was any chance of her surviving something like that i would like to think so i would like to think that they had at least a good life towards the end and they had well, i guess they probably starved to death i guess yeah so maybe not a good life but they i feel like they would have had a chance she would have tried to land that plane mm-hmm. on land or whatever I, I can just get that sense yes and then i feel obviously what happened after that was you know, perhaps they weren't to, to fight whatever land they were on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Crab or no crab. Crab or no crab. So, yeah. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. Remember, you can always find us on Instagram at The Compendium Podcast. You can also send us an email at thecompendiumpod at gmail.com. 
Remember, we always love hearing from you with your comments and your suggestions. And again, until we meet next week, stay safe and stay curious. See ya. See ya.